May 15th, 2019. That's today. We're releasing a new video. But we're talking about an event that happened 155 years ago, on May 15th, 1864. I'm Sarah K. Byerly with Gazette 665, and today I invite you to join us for a discussion of the Battle of Newmarket in the words of the people who were there. It's my belief that primary sources are key to understanding what happened in the past. Yes, we have to be careful when we look at primary sources. Sometimes memories can change as time goes on, or things can be remembered in a certain way. But we're fortunate to have some primary sources that were written close to the battle, or actually during the campaign, along with ones written in decades after the conflict. Today I want to share a sampling of some of those primary sources with you. And rather than sit here and have me read them to you and end up looking down at my paper the whole time, or do the awkward look down, look at the camera, look down, look at the camera, I thought it would be much nicer, much more appropriate to read the primary sources while you're looking at photographs, historic photographs and pictures of the battlefield or other historic sites relevant to what's being shared in these primary sources. So without further ado, let's get started. This is the Battle of Newmarket in the words of its participants and witnesses. Cadet Jacqueline Beverly Stannard from Virginia Military Institute took time to write a letter to his mother during the campaign. By the time the Corps of Cadets reached Stanton, Virginia, he was ready to take some time and share with his mother that he was on the march, he was expecting a battle soon, and that he hoped he would see her soon. He wanted to send her some reassurance, and this is an excerpt from the letter that he sent to her. May the 12th, 1864. My darling mother, no doubt a letter written from this place will take you greatly by surprise. Well, to relieve your anxiety, I will tell you before going further and keep you from uneasiness. On Tuesday night, an order came from General Breckinridge, calling us immediately to Stanton. In obedience to his orders, we fixed up and left on Wednesday morning at half past eight, marched 18 miles by half past two when we camped. The roads were very good and were quite dusty, and then it was very warm. This morning we left camp under quite different circumstances. It having rained during the night and has continued to do so all day, the roads were awful perfect loblolly all the way, and we had to wade through like hogs. Well, darling mother, I have written enough, I suppose, to relieve your mind as to our destination, so I must stop and go in the parlor. Give my love to all acquaintances and friends. I shall write whenever I have an opportunity. And now, dear mother, that I may be spared to see you all again, and that you may continue in good health, will be the nightly prayer of your darling boy. David H. Strother served as a staff officer for General Franz Siegel, the Union General, in the Newmarket Campaign. He kept a journal during the Civil War and gives us some enlightening excerpts about what was going on during the Newmarket campaign. He was a bit prejudiced, so some of his journal entries must be taken with care, but he gives a very close look at what was really going on at Siegel's headquarters during the campaign, and how Siegel and his staff arrived at Newmarket on May 15, 1864. May 15th. We at length got off in the mud and rain, as gruff and uncomfortable as we could well be. In the village of Edinburgh, we found the shops and houses full of unarmed stragglers from Boyd's command. The sound of cannon was heard at intervals, growing more distinct as we advanced, showing that the enemy had made a stand somewhere and was no longer retiring. Pushing forward, we presently reached Colonel Moore's position on a hill at the right of Dr. Rice's home at the northern extremity of Newmarket. Having communicated with Moore, Siegel left his staff near Rice's house and rode forward to reconnoiter. While he was absent, a number of shells whistled over our heads. 
This was about midday. Siegel seemed in a state of excitement and rode here and there with Stahl and Moore, all jabbering in German. In his excitement, he seemed to forget his English entirely, and the purely American portion of his staff were totally useless to him. I followed him up and down until I got tired, and, finding a group of his staff officers together near a battery, I stopped and got a drink of whiskey and a cracker, which an artilleryman gave to me. Cadet John Wise from Virginia Military Institute wrote extensively about the Battle of Newmarket in the post-war years. His writings are truly beautiful and very inspirational. So to start off, here is an excerpt from his book, End of an Era, which is an autobiographical story of his life in the antebellum South and the American Civil War. And this is how he describes the moment when the Corps of Cadets is on Shirley's Hill and they are supposed to be advancing in reserve, but they'll come under Union artillery fire. This would be about midday on May 15, 1864. The command was given to strip for action. Knapsacks, blankets, everything but guns, canteens, and cartridge boxes was thrown upon the ground. Our boys were silent then. Every lip was tightly drawn, every cheek was pale, but not with fear. Whistling rifle shells screamed over us as, tipping the hill crest in our front, they bounded past. To our right, across the pike, Patton's brigade was lying down, abreast of us. Attention! Battalion forward! Guide center! Shouted ship, and up the slope we started. Brave Evans, standing six feet two, shook out the colors that for days had hung limp and bedraggled about the staff, and every cadet leaped forward, dressing to the ensign, elate and thrilling with the consciousness that this was war. The enemy's veteran artillery soon obtained our range and began to drop his shells under our very noses along the slope. Down the green slope we went, answering the wild cry of our comrades. Then came a sound more stunning than thunder. It burst directly in my face. I stumbled. My gun pitched forward. I fell upon my knees. Sergeant Cable looked at me pityingly. I knew no more. The Corps of Cadets, as described by John Wise, followed in reserve at this point in the battle. There were advanced Confederate units that were pushing the Union regiments back. They moved through several positions, and eventually both sides will establish lines near the Bushong Farm. I like to call them the Bushong Lines. It's east of the Bushong Farm, in an area first called Strayer's Pasture, then called Bloody Cedars, that the Union Regiment, the 54th Pennsylvania, makes a courageous, desperate, and yet fatal charge into a ravine and Confederate fire. The moment is later described in a battle report by one of their officers. I ordered the 54th also to charge, which was done with alacrity and spirit. Advancing beyond the crest of the hill, a rapid, vigorous, and as I believe, effective fire was for some time kept up on the enemy, and every effort made by them to advance on the front occupied by my regiment was firmly and resolutely resisted, although we sustained a galling and destructive fire. The enemy, however, pressed forward his right, which extended some distance beyond our left, and was rapidly flanking me in that direction, despite the most determined resistance, when my attention was called to the fact that the regiment on my right had given way, and the enemy was advancing at almost right angle with my line, and extending beyond the rear and right of my regiment. A few minutes only would be required to completely surround my regiment, and in the absence of any appearance of advancing support, I was reluctantly compelled to order my command to retire. This was done in as good order as the circumstances allowed. Colonel Jacob M. Campbell, 54th Pennsylvania Infantry. As Confederate soldiers fight along their Bushong lines, a gap emerges in the Confederate line. Confederate General John Breckinridge is forced to make the decision to send in the cadets, the Corps of Cadets, to fill the gap in his line. He does so 
and some of the incidents are recorded by John Wise in his reminiscence, End of an Era. The Corps was being decimated. Manifestly, they must charge or fall back, and charge it was, for at that moment Henry Wise, beloved of every boy in the command, sprang to his feet, shouted out the command to rise up and charge, and moving in advance of the line, led the cadet corps forward to the guns. The battery was being served superbly. The musketry fairly rolled, but the cadets never faltered. They reached the firm green sward in which the guns were planted. The federal infantry began to break. Before the order to limber up could be obeyed by the artillerymen, the cadets disabled the teams and were close upon the guns. The gunners dropped their sponges and sought safety in flight. Lieutenant Hanna hammered a gunner over the head with his cadet sword. Winder Garrett outran another and lunged his bayonet into him. The boys leaped upon the guns and the battery was theirs. Evans, the color sergeant, stood wildly waving the cadet colors from the top of a caisson. As the Union lines along Bushong Hill begin to collapse, the troops, the Union troops, will retreat northward. However, in those moments, there was still great courage displayed by individual soldiers. One of those soldiers was Sergeant James Madison Burns, who would later receive a Medal of Honor for his action at the Battle of New Market. Here's what happened, and this is according to his citation for the Medal of Honor. November 20th, 1896. The President of the United States, in the name of Congress, takes pleasure in presenting the Medal of Honor to Sergeant James Madison Burns, United States Army, for extraordinary heroism on the 15th of May, 1864, while serving with Company B, 1st West Virginia Infantry, in action at Newmarket, Virginia. Under a heavy fire of musketry, Sergeant Burns rallied a few men to the support of the colors, in danger of capture, and bore them to a place of safety. One of his comrades, having been severely wounded in the effort, Sergeant Burns went back a hundred yards in the face of the enemy's fire and carried the wounded man from the field. A young artillery captain named Henry DuPont played a major role in covering the Union retreat as the army headed for the Shenandoah River and the single bridge across it at Mount Jackson. Henry DuPont uses artillery to cover the retreat and he uses some innovative tactics. He describes the, the time of the retreat and what happens when he reaches the bridge this way. These artillery positions, known in the tactics of that day as a retirement by echelon of platoons, consumed but very few moments. When I galloped back to the front and remained with Lieutenant Holman's pieces, which continued to fire with great rapidity and precision until we found ourselves entirely alone, with not a single Federal soldier in sight, save the members of our own battery. In view of the retreat and demoralization of our troops, it seemed prudent to take steps to prevent the enemy from crossing the river during the night, and though there were no orders in regard to the bridge, I took the responsibility of partially destroying it, but never received, subsequently, either commendation or censor with respect to my action. As the planking was removed and then set on fire under my immediate supervision, it fell to my lot to be the last person to cross. But no special credit was involved, as we were not under fire at the time, and the enemy had wholly discontinued his pursuit. The Battle of Newmarket was over. By the end of May 15, 1864, the Union Army was back across the Shenandoah River. They hadn't gained access to Newmarket Gap. They had not finished the campaign objective given to them, which was to advance to Stanton, Virginia. Instead, there was another retreat, another Union retreat in the Shenandoah Valley, and another Confederate victory. Because of the role of the Virginia Military Institute cadets, 
Newmarket would be remembered. Newmarket became a defining moment in the lives of these young men, and when they were older and decades had passed, they wanted to make sense of the battle. They wanted to understand what they had done, who they had fought, who their comrades had been on the Confederate line. Some of them made great efforts to write to cadet, former cadets and Confederate and Union veterans who were still alive, asking about memories and details of the Battle of Newmarket. Thanks to these efforts, there is a wonderful collection of primary sources and even debate letters about what really happened at Newmarket. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it has added some history to your day and that the excerpts from these primary sources have been educational and hopefully inspiring to you. As you go through today, May 15th, 2019, please remember that it's been 155 years since the Battle of Newmarket, a battle that changed a small Virginia community and the lives of hundreds of soldiers on both sides. Thank you. I hope you have an inspired week, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.